This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Okay, welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill here with you as today we welcome in a panel discussion featuring board members and associates of the Sankofa Community Connection in Newport, Rhode Island. And we get into a whole host of issues in this um, proverbial roundtable on some of the challenges that communities of color are facing in Newport and, frankly, that expand out to the general population as well. This is important dialogue that has been ongoing from an organizational standpoint with Sankofa for the last five years. Um, You'll hear from founder Nico Merritt, as well as, again, several other voices from the community in Newport. But this is a conversation, folks, that can be extrapolated all the way out, not only to a statewide, region-wide discussion, but honestly a national one. But having said that, this is a hyper-specific conversation to Newport as well in the sense of When I first started exploring Newport coming up from New York, of course, I grew up in Rhode Island, spent 21 years here before I moved away to the city for a decade. But I started to come back and really for the first time explore Newport beyond just going to the festivals or, you know, my cousin taking me to the tall ships or something like that. And I was shocked, absolutely shocked to discover um, just how divided the city is in a physical, material sense um, in terms of where you would find neighborhoods consisting mostly of con- communities of color versus those that are, I guess, primarily white. So we get into that and how all of this is impacting education, housing, the day-to-day experiences of folks who are members of the communities of color that reside in Newport. Really important stuff. We get into the politics of Newport, the city council, What kind of role are they doing to improve this? Is it superficial or absent altogether? A really powerful conversation here today on B-Town, which you may support by sending a one-time donation to Venmo at Bill Bartholomew or PayPal.me slash Bill Bartholomew or become a sustaining member for as little as $3 per month by visiting Patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town. That's Patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town. Hey, It's all of you out there that help to support and sustain the independent journalism, opinion, analysis, and entertainment that the Bartholomew Town Podcast delivers with two episodes per week, plus our social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Bill Bartholomew. And be sure to join the Bartholomew Town Podcast Facebook group for daily discussions. But support us at patreon.com slash Bartholomew Town. Okay, let's get into it right now. Members of the Sankofa Community Connection, they'll introduce themselves, and then we'll get into a healthy discussion for the next, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Um, We could have gone on probably for an hour minimum on this topic, but here it is. Sankofa Community Connection on B-Town. There's a lot of challenges that are going on statewide, specifically in Newport, and we're going to get into some of those today and also the work that you're doing with your organization. But before we begin, let's go around and just a just a quick intro so we can match up the voices to the names. We'll start with Nico. All right. So founding executive director of Sanko for Community Connection. I'm um, Ellen Pinnock. I am the um, president of Sanko for Community Connection. I am Susan Kenny. I'm a new board member. Amy McKinney, also newer board member. Hi, Melanie McKinney, new board member. Thanks. I am Nicole. I'm vice president uh, of the board of St. Cofa Community Connection and director of Newport Art House. All right. So let's let's start with sort of Nico. Where did the where did this begin in terms of an, an organizational uh, structure and 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 what have you built out over these last few years? Okay, so this year, I'm proud to say we're celebrating our fifth year of Sankofa. Um, The board that you see before you is a brand new board. Um, They were chosen because they're all dynamic community members. They all want to make change, and they're all about action. So um, definitely proud to have people um, that you see before you on this um, board of directors for Sankofa. We've expanded programming, things that we offer, um, community events, and we are um, continuing forward. Is that background noise too loud? Should I go somewhere else? Are it's you tolerable. Okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So let, let's talk about, let, let's zero in on the specific challenges in Newport that you know, when you say you have events and and so on and so forth, a lot of them are enjoyable and entertaining, but there's a lot more to it than just that. You know, it's not just pure entertainment. So let's talk about some of the things that 
are, and, and again, zooming in on Newport, but this is also totally relevant for a statewide or even frankly national conversation. What are the challenges that you're are trying to address through the events and, and sort of the community organization that you've built and, and how are you doing that? And we'll, I guess let's go around. We'll start with Ellen. Yeah, um, so as far as the challenges, um, being in Newport, um, it's not like, so folks think that Newport is diverse. And if you look at the demographics, I guess you would think that some areas are, but as far as like the black and brown population, most folks are in one area in Newport. So the city's definitely very um, divided. So it's been quite a challenge to amplify and uplift like the voice of black and brown people until Sankofa came in um, and let like there's a platform now for us to be able to do that. And I think that we do actually do that very well, Um, not just with the events, but there's a lot of education that's happening as well, not just with students or with our community, but with folks outside of our community that serve our community. Sankofa um, has taken over the Trust and Equity Alliance, both myself and Nico, and we have another woman, Michelle Marks Osborne, who helps facilitate some of the trainings. Um, She did the anti-racism active accomplice training through the month of February. And through that training, like some of the the top executives from a lot of the organizations and agencies that serve our black and brown community are the ones that are in these trainings. And I think a lot of eyes have been opened. There's definitely been a lot of people that have gained some more wisdom and knowledge. Um, And now the next iteration will be us helping them to apply that because without applying it, it's, you know, not going to go very far. Yeah. It's just song and dance at that point. Yeah. And, And, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, please. No, I was saying, so like Sankofa is the accountability piece and that's not Mm -hmm. something that has happened previously. Um, organizations and agencies come into our community and they say that they'll do these things and they try to do these things. And either those things are just left or there's not any community input. Sankofa is the piece of this puzzle where the community not only has input, but representation and now people to hold these other folks accountable. Amy, you know, one thing that I noticed when I first moved to Newport and or even just started to, to hang out there. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island, spent little time in Newport, though, until like 2015 when I moved back from New York, is exactly what Ellen mentioned, that division. It's a physical boundary, Mm -hmm. oftentimes walled, and it feels like that there is an intentional separation Mm -hmm. of communities in Newport. Is that something that that you you get the sense is is real? I mean, it obviously is real, but that, that impacts the day-to-day lives, the day-to-day experiences of people who are in those divided communities, and what sort of reaction has the city itself, um, mayors, elected officials, other influential people, sort of given to that um, that notion that Newport is a divided city? I would say, yes, it absolutely is divided. Um, my sister and I actually um, grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood, and we actually have been asked if we live in the neighborhood when we're walking around in our neighborhood where we grew up. So wow. if you are in an, a different, if you happen to be a person of color in a different neighborhood outside of what we know is like the designated aid area for people of color, we have actually encountered people who treat us as though we don't belong there. Like we couldn't possibly be from that neighborhood. So it is 100% real and personally experienced. I think I um, was driven to become more involved with Sankofa because exactly um, the question that you just asked, our elected officials have actually gone on record as saying, we don't have those kind of problems here. So I think, wait, when was the last time you asked a person of color what their personal experience is in in the city is? Because they think if you ask them personally, they are going to tell you, we do have those problems here. Yeah, I mean, that's just obviously just putting your head in the sand and, and trying to stay in your own mm-hmm. lane. Um, mm-hmm. Nicole, you have an interesting project that, that I know of from a previous experience that that we've had together, which is when you think about Newport, you think about, oh, OK, there's there's a lot of art. You know, you've got the, the various art museums, music, huge festivals, so on and so forth. But in terms of the north end of the city, there isn't a gallery space. And when I look at the roster of um, 
performances and showings on all the major galleries in town, both at the, the local and sort of larger level, uh, they're very white, oftentimes white male oriented. You're trying to overcome that. Can you kind of speak to that? Sure. Um, so like you mentioned, there's zero sort of gallery space on the north end of Newport where predominantly the people of color reside. And I really feel like there should be some space that is designated for people of color, not to exclude anyone, but just to have that protected space where people of color would feel welcome. Um, because if you come, I'm over here at the Newport Art Museum, but if you come to this side of town and you're a person of color, a lot of times you don't feel welcome. You don't see any representation. So I'm trying to just have that representation in the North End. Uh, so it's easily accessible. There aren't any barriers as far as transportation or, you know, getting your hands on some supplies to be able to express your creativity. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to making that change and, and having a space that's open to the, the people of the community Yeah, it's in, their, in their backyard. It's obviously super essential and it's, it's actually shocking when when you look at those rosters of of artists and performers and so on and so forth and and how one directional it is of course it reflects the direction of the city in in a lot of other areas but um and that's a problem that should be overcome um susan i wonder you know your your background and how you came to be a board member here and your experiences with the city of newport I had come to know um, Rico through the Women's Fund of Rhode Island, just through a brief um, podcast about four months ago, I believe it was. And I had been wanting to get involved in a some sort of a community project where I felt there was real action going on, real, real awareness, real, <laughs> real um, improvement and in communications and just allowing people to not only express themselves, but also to realize uh, what communities of color are dealing with and how to basically um, basically improve that. And so when I contacted Nico, she was very, very helpful and very, um, I would say welcoming. And I thought because I live here, I would like very much to, um, be part of the part of the action so and i'm happy that i was asked to to do that melanie i i when i just read and i don't have the paper in front of me but i just read in newport this week that the graduation rate for newport students is extremely low relative to the rest of the state rogers is a school that is ranks at the bottom of the state in terms of its physical infrastructure when people think of newport the average person thinks of yachts and you know probably kids going to private schools, you know, wearing suits or something like that. The reality is Newport has an educational issue that is on par with Providence. What is Sankofa doing to address that? It obviously overlaps enormously with other challenges. It's not exclusive to communities of color, but it is certainly reflected in communities of color in Newport. Oh, I completely agree. Um, my daughter was a senior this year. She just recently graduated. Um, and it was a huge struggle. Most of my friends that grew up in Newport chose to leave Newport once they started to have children and realized how difficult it was to get their child, um, a decent education in Newport. Um, and honestly, it's embarrassing mm -hmm. and it just shouldn't be. And we have the resources. And, you know, it's almost like you don't know really what the answer is, um, because when you go to the school department and discuss these things with them, they don't, again, seem to really see that there's an issue. They put it squarely on the parents to have their kids um, get a decent education and you know, you advocate for your children and you, you, it shouldn't be such a struggle. Yep. And again, as a parent, very involved, but it's so difficult um, 
And at the end of the day, you do see these resources going towards things such as, you know, the football uniforms rather than, you know, your child's education. It's just become such a a barrier to get your child an education. And then people just move out of town for that reason. And how do we get people back here to fund that education is really the big question. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and when we come back from a quick break right here, I just want to kind of do a lightning round with everybody. Housing in Newport right now is a disaster. There's no other way to put it. It's an embarrassment. Um, we, we just saw Governor McKee veto legislation that would require the registration of Airbnbs, which are crippling the city of Newport. But I'm curious on all of your takes on housing and some of the other issues. We'll do a lightning round when we come back here with the Sankofa Community Connection on Rhode Island's podcast of record, the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Be sure to follow me on social media at Bill Bartholomew on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and join the Bartholomew Town Podcast Facebook group for daily discussions on all things Rhode Island politics and beyond. Okay, so one more piece on the school element, Nico, that that you're working on. Let's start with that discussion. All right, so I'm pleased to announce that we got um, approved through a grant through the Department of Health for a community resiliency program. So it's like a self-care healing circle, racial socialization for black and brown students in the middle school. And so what we're doing is bringing families together for a seven-week program where we discuss the difficult topics, the microaggressions, um, basically building their toolbox um, so that they're better prepared for situations that arise, um, so that they can recognize things and name them, and so that we can build up the um, communication and relationship between the families and the schools. So um, it's an exciting program. The participants will um, get like um, a gift for participating and for their time. We'll feed them dinner. We'll look out for them. And um, it's just like bringing everybody together to wrap around. So I'm so thankful that it was approved and that we can get started. So we're working, it's going to come this fall sometime. Thank you. That's great. I mean, that's obviously essential to the cause here. Um, All right, let's go around and feel free to jump in for the audience listening right now. You know, bear with us because we're, uh, it's the lightning round, so to speak. So um, Newport City Council, the school board, you know, uh, it, it seems like on many issues they're not they're not paying attention to the community that their issue their interests are unrelated to the average everyday life of the community. Um, frankly, I feel like the entire um, city council uh, basically could be replaced with people who would better represent the community. Just from an observational standpoint, I've you know you had mayor former mayor Bova last year sort of on the front lines of Black Lives Matter protests at the same time. I'm not sure what really improved inside City Hall. Should the Newport City Council be replaced? Should, should the school board be replaced? Would any of you be willing to, to run for Exception. those offices? Yeah. Um, they're, they're, so I have been present at some of the meetings and we have um, our representation here in the North End, um, Angela, who for the most part, is the one voice usually that is pushing back against um, city council. Like take, for instance, the school, the superintendent had gone before city council and asked for an increase in funding, um, which was voted with the exception of two, Angela and one other, I believe it was Jamie, um, was voted against that. And even with the argument that our students, our black and brown kids would be the kids that are, you know, the most affected um, without that increase. Um, I definitely do not think that they are um, representing us at all, Um, the city council, not in our educational needs, not in our equity, not in anything. And um, we have spoken, several of us have spoken at different city council meetings about the needs um, and the inequities that exist for the BIPOC community here in Newport. And it is almost like talking to the wall. Um, To be honest, it's very evident that our voices have been suppressed over, you know, time. But now that there are some of us that are more vocal, they still attempt to do that. Um, 
But for the most part, we're going to continue um, uplifting our needs and desires and wants for our BIPOC community because it's necessary. Um, but I definitely think that some candidates need to run, and I know that some are, are and will be in the upcoming election um, to try to get some of them replaced. I unfortunately and I, think that it's become a popularity contest. It becomes yeah. name recognition and a popularity contest. I can say for my ward, my representative, I never, literally never saw him in my ward until he was running. And then I saw him maybe two or three times and have not seen him since he won. So I feel like if you aren't around in the ward talking to the people and what their needs are, how can you possibly believe that you can represent them? It's just completely outrageous to me. And I think that it seems clear, like we all know who, who they are. I think mm -hmm. it seems clear that there are some members who are completely, completely tone deaf. I wonder when was the last time that they actually went out and talked to people. I think a lot of them just get, get voted in again on name recognition and the other ones, it's a popularity contest. I do think a lot of them need to be voted out. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much we are doing and maybe we should be doing more in this area, educating our voters. You can go on and you can look at their voting record before you vote in our next election. I would say go on and look at the voting record of our city council members and see if they are voting based on what you think the needs of the city are. And um, I would like to add, so in addition to putting people in office, um, we find like, oh, we need to just have more black and brown people. Um, it's beyond that. We need people that actually want to make change. Um, usually when they're newly in office, they don't want to shake it up or, or oh, let me be unpopular real, real quick. Um, so we need people and we need the majority as well. So it's not just putting three in there. We need four or more to mm -hmm. actually um, make change and not be afraid to speak out or not get tired because you're the only one that's doing it. So it's like it needs to be um, both someone who's willing to take the lead and make changes and stop going along with it. Cause otherwise you'll just have another black or brown person voting with the same policies that have been in place and mm -hmm. nothing changes. So we need people to implement and be um, fearless in that. And it doesn't seem like it is like you get in and you're bullied into behaving a certain way or voting with the, the crowd because that's how they do it. And I think they should also enforce term limits. You mm -hmm. shouldn't be on the city council for 90 years. <laughs> yeah, 90 years gotta, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to keep it moving. So. I agree that. with Nico. Definitely <laughs> agree with Nico. It's not just getting a person that looks like us on city council. That person that looks like us has to represent the our community needs. Like, they have to because our needs are not being met. Like, you know, there's so much conversation going on about like speed cameras and all these stuff. But if you come into the North End, there aren't even any speed limit signs yeah. posted. So there's like these things that are like grassroots that they need to fix. They're going straight to the top and, you know, just trying to do things that will placate or pacify. And it's not helpful to our community at all. And it's as long as the folks that are in are in, it's going to constantly be like a, a five to two a vote or whatever, because there are some people in there that just go with the majority. So they don't like ruffle feathers. Right. And you, I've noticed as well, you know, a big deal being made about, for example, the Columbus statue. Now I've, I've been on record. I think Columbus is, you know, it's a joke, you know, that right. celebrate Christopher Columbus. I mean, it's embarrassing, but at the same time, like Keith Stokes said to me at one point, when he goes by that statue, he just sees it as some guy going bowling. You know, he's got the world in his hand. Like you can ignore that and just say, whatever the policies are, what needs to be addressed. Right. That's where, you we know, the other stuff. Both, though. Well, we should do both. I don't believe me. I'm, I'm with you all the way. The Columbus statue is, is, um, is an embarrassment to the city. I think at this point, nobody should. Be. Yeah. Like respectability politics runs rampant in Newport and, um, I know it's a national thing and I know people will say, oh, it happens everywhere. I like to deal with where we live and what we mm -hmm. can do to impact change. So it's like, uh -huh. you have to stop that whole, um, well, you shouldn't be mad about this, blah, blah, blah. Like we can, I can be mad at everything I want and yep. we can still work to make changes and feel like um, Columbus shouldn't be celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, my children shouldn't participate in a Columbus 
play in their school. I don't think that's appropriate, knowing that what we know. So it's time for change in general. You can't just keep doing it the way you do it and say, oh, that's how we've always done it or whatever. So right. I'm over yep. the whole, oh, that's what we do. And so having new city council members um, that have fresh perspective and that aren't stuck in the, that's the way we do it all the time would be super helpful. Mm -hmm. And again, it's beyond voting for um, women or brown people or this or that. Like we need people that are in there that are ready, ready to shake it up and that um, there needs to be a group instead of just one person mm -hmm. that work together. Absolutely. All right. What I want to do now is in our last few moments here, just each person um, will go around in 10 to 30 seconds, the number one issue Newporters are facing as a whole and communities of color are facing as a whole in Newport right now. And we'll start with Ellen. Hey, it's number one issue, huh? Mm. Um, <laughs> there's so many. I, I, I will say right now that it is definitely um, housing, yep. affordable housing. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that because there's a list. Um, that I, I feel like so many things should have the number one spot that th they're like fighting against each other, but housing is huge. Amy? I'm actually going to agree with that. I think housing, I think the discussion gets to, you know, affordable housing and people think, you know, like subsidized housing, like there are regular residents who have decent, like who, uh, you know, just need a place that they can, uh, that, that they can afford, like even single people can't afford to have like a one bedroom apartment. It's just outrageous. Like, 100% affordable housing. Yeah. Yep. Nicole? Yeah, housing is definitely at the top of the list, but it definitely uh, goes hand in hand with um, with jobs. Like what kind of jobs are available here in Newport? They keep building hotels. They keep building banks. Like we don't really need any more hotels. We need jobs for our young people once they graduate to be able to afford to, to live here, to stay here. Melanie? Um. I definitely agree with housing. Um, and when you go to our elected officials and their collective response is, well, you can just move. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to believe it's very intentional that they want us to leave. It is for sure. Um, Susan. Um, affordable housing has to be number one Yeah. in this community. That's, um, I think that's the top top priority right now. Yep. After that, it would be uh, more inclusive education. And that has to be a trickle down kind of thing starting at the youngest levels and coming right up. Um, that's super important, I think, too, because people aren't even aware of a lot of issues. So that that has to happen, too. But first and foremost, more affordable housing, much more. And Nico. So, um, my, I think the top for me is racism um, and the subtle racism that takes place in Newport. It's because of that racism that our students aren't doing well in school, that we're all trapped on one side of the town, um, that we can't move around Newport, that we can't hang out downtown, that we can't get our hair done. Um, it's all this um, subtle racism that's blocking us from getting to other places. And the fact that no one wants to talk about it, the fact that people are ignoring that it's happening is going to continue to make us invisible in Newport. So we need to work on that and become visible and stand our ground. Yeah, 100 percent, totally 100 percent unacceptable um, going from from this point forward for elected officials, the media, education officials, people on the ground, business owners, large, small, whatever. Um, you know, I don't even know what else to say because they dropped the ball after the summer. It's yeah. like now, oh, racism is solved. Everything's all set. And like yeah. people just gave up on the black community. And it's very disappointing. Like we still have work to do, but they act like everything is done. So it was like we were a during COVID hobby. But now that COVID is going away or people are being vaccinated, we're dropped again. And that's totally unfair. So it's like, this is something that is gonna take a while. It's gonna take all hands on deck and we need to keep going instead of um, forgetting about it. We always get left behind. Sankofa Community Connection Newport. Um, your offices are located on Broadway, right in the uh, in the downtown, right where I used to live until uh, became an Airbnb where I live. But what are you gonna mm. do, you know? And uh, it's it's the work you're doing is so important and 
to me, you are the most legitimate voice in the city when it comes to these issues, even more so than the elected officials. So thanks so much for all of you for making time today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits. And 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.